Let's get a live report from New Hampshire in the trial against Adam Montgomery with our own Court TV crime and justice correspondent, Matt Johnson. Matt, always great to have you on. Thank you for joining us. Now, a few witnesses have testified about Adam assaulting Harmony. Tell us more about what you've learned. What a tough day of testimony. Day one was um, Judge Ashley and Michael. The main theme for today, straight out the gates for prosecutors, was talking about the assault charge and how Harmony was injured and abused at the hands of her father, allegedly, Adam Montgomery. Take a listen. When you got home, did you see Harmony there? I did. Where did you see her? I see her standing in the kitchen. And when you saw her in the kitchen, how did she look to you? She had a black eye. How did the black eye look? Um, full. Like a, a raccoon's eye, black and blue. Black and blue? Yes. And when you say full, what do you mean by full? Can you give us a good All example? the way around. All three of these witnesses on your screen testified about the injuries that they saw on little Harmony Montgomery's eye, including his uncle Kevin Montgomery, his ex-girlfriend while he was still married, Katie Morin, and a childhood friend, Nicholas Ahern. Again, they testified about the injuries. Here's more of that. He stated that the worst thing that he had ever, that had ever happened or he had done was um, he walked out of the bathroom and Harmony was suffocating the baby. So he backhanded her as a, I don't know if it was as a reaction is the way it was told to me, um, to stop her from suffocating. Um, he said he hit her glasses, so she ended up with a black eye. She came out of the house and she had a marks on her face, which was a black eye. Her <coughs> eyes were blackened. Uh, yeah, it was pretty, pretty intense at the mo in the moment, yeah. Was it concerning to you? It was, but he um, told me that she acquired it during a soccer accident. I have kids, so I understand, you know, accidents happen. And Crystal Sori was seated next to me in the gallery, a few over, and I could see her in tears looking down during some of that tough testimony, hearing the abuse of her daughter. Yeah, that may be the reason why uh, Adam Montgomery didn't want to show up, knowing that that would be testified to yeah. today. Speaking of Crystal Sori, uh, Harmony's mother, biological mother, now she took the stand as well. Um, tell us about her testimony, Matt. Her testimony was very pivotal because, again, the jury was paying close attention to her. When she was out in the gallery crying, they were looking over at her quite a bit. When she was up on the stand, their eyes were glued to her as she talked about what a loving little girl that she still misses to this day, obviously. Five-year-old Harmony, who loved Mickey Mouse, Minnie Mouse, and she loved being a big sister. Um, she had to wipe away tears during part of her testimony when she talked about the last time she saw her alive. Take a listen. When did you last see Harmony? April. April 2019. Of, April of 2019? Yeah, right before Easter. How did you see her? Oh, um... I was doing a Facebook video call. By December of 2021, what else were you doing to try to find Harmony? I yeah, was... To respond. I was, you know, calling DCF. I was, um, you know, telling my therapist, talking to anybody that I knew was either a mandated reporter or had some type of leverage because I wasn't getting anywhere. I had wrote also to the mayor. 
And Crystal Sori has been at the courthouse here each and every day, even if uh, she's not seen in the gallery there. She does have a lot of support here at the courthouse, including her sister and a lot of friends. She's unable to speak to the media because she may be recalled as a witness. All right, Matt, certainly take care of yourself, too. We know you're in the courtroom. You're listening to all this firsthand. Take care of us. Everybody really needs to take care of themselves. It's so important to bring this out. But it's it's hard details to listen to. Tell us, Matt, because the opening statements, I, those were emphatic. Tell us what information you took away from those opening statements, please. I appreciate that because, you know, a lot of our viewers are also sharing the fact that the opening statements were so disturbing, but it really lays out the case at hand here because the state is really doubling down on the fact that they say Montgomery abused his daughter and then, you know, moved her remains, squishing it into different bags. They actually held up a bag. And then in that other screenshot, you can see the defense attorney holding up a note talking about Kayla Montgomery, his wife, because she's expected to testify. And their whole case hinges on the fact that they're pointing the murder on her. Take a listen. It's about a man who for two years evaded apprehension, didn't have to answer for his crimes had no appreciation or concern about Harmony being missing because he already knew she was dead. For two years before the Manchester Police Department initiated their search for Harmony Montgomery, that man got away with murder. His only concern, other than Harmony's body being found, was to keep his wife, Kayla Montgomery, from coming in here and telling you all what he did to her, his heinous actions, his cover-up, what she witnessed. For two years, he got away with butchering a five-year-old girl. And that defendant made sure that Harmony would never be found, that she'd be gone without a trace. You'll see, he believed that if there was no body, there could be no evidence of the horrible things that he did to her, and he would get away with it. And so he went to great lengths to cover up his crimes, to cover up beating Harmony to death for a bathroom accident. He went to great lengths to cover up his conduct. Beating Harmony to death because she soiled herself. Adam Montgomery did not cause Harmony's death. Kayla Montgomery was the last person to see Harmony alive and know how Harmony died. But she didn't come clean with Adam. She didn't come clean with the police. And she will not come clean with you. And today, during testimony of abuse and the mother of his child, Harmony Montgomery, taking the stand, Adam Montgomery was not here. This is the second day that he refused transport during his murder trial. The judge, Amy Messer, saying that she is allowing one option each morning if he wants to get on the bus and come here to court. Um, again, he has denied. Now, I did ask his defense attorneys as they were leaving today if they had any comment as to why he hasn't been in court and if he'll be here tomorrow. They said they have no comment. All right, Matt Johnson, thank you so much for your great reporting there live in New Hampshire. Let's welcome our guest for this hour, civil rights and trial attorney Adante Pointer. And I want to start there, Adante. And Michael, you said something that I've been wondering, and I'd mm -hmm. love to get your thoughts. And that is the fact that Adam Montgomery is again, day two, not in court. He gets the choice every morning. He's refused transport both days. But, you know, you hear what the witnesses, all three say he did to Harmony Montgomery, and I have a visceral reaction. I don't like this man at all whatsoever, and it angers me. Is there a point to not having him there so that the jury can't look at him and connect him immediately to the things that are being described on the stand? I think there is some strategy behind that. You know, certainly some benefit to the defendant uh, not being there in court because you are going to look at him and see how he responds and is his response appropriate? Is he teary-eyed? Is he crying? Is he looking remorseful? Is he looking guilty? Those are all the things that a jury would want to see and looking towards him to see his reaction if he was sitting there in court. 
The other way a jury could look at this is saying, this guy's a coward. Mm -hmm. If you didn't do this and you wanted to take this to trial, why are you not here to face this evidence, to face your accusers, and sit here and give us a presence of I'm innocent, at least innocent until proven guilty, versus an empty chair being an empty soul, which therefore means a guilty, convicted person? That's kind of where I fall on this thing. Mm. It's like if you're going to stand up in court in this in his other court case and talk about these are preposterous allegations and I'm not guilty of that, well then you need to be in that courtroom. And the mm -hmm. fact that you're not there to me would rub a jury the wrong way. Yeah. But you know, if it is strategy, I understand that you know you may think that's the way to go. But mm, I, I struggle with that. Can I ask you really quickly? Sure. Does the jury know? Do they say to the jury he chose not to be here today, or there's no comment about that open seat? I well, don't know how that works. Yeah, the judge will not say that directly unless okay. one of the sides requests. It, okay. And I don't know if they've actually requested it or not. Okay. Um, if I were that's the defense, good. I wouldn't request it. If I was the state, I would want right. to request okay, it. Right, okay, that's so good information. We, we'll have to find out if actually they're doing it in this case. So Dante, quickly, I want to talk about the assault charge in this case. We had a lot of testimony about it today. It was really ugly testimony. But it really highlighted the importance of that charge in general. It was There was a lot of argument as to whether it should be allowed in the case. Of course, the defense wanted it out. State wanted it in. But when you think about it from the state's point of view, Getting that charge in is so important mm -hmm. because it really, if this defense, and they probably anticipated they would try to point the finger at Kayla, but when you already have an assault in front of this jury that really mirrors what is claimed to be done to her that take, took her life, I think that's so important, especially in light of the fact we know the defense is going to say Kayla was responsible. Absolutely. You know, you don't have a body here, so you're not able to use the corpse or the body and say, this is what happened, this is the physical evidence. So now you have to kind of, you know, I don't want to say stack the deck, but you have to build your pyramid of evidence based upon a foundation of, well, what do we know about the way he treated her? Where we do have witnesses to corroborate, or at least to come into court and say his course of conduct or behavior with his daughter. And it's devastating that the people who are, you would think, closest to him, best friend, uncles, things like that, come into court one after one, get on the stand, point at him and say, this is what he did to this beautiful young girl. This is what he did to his own daughter. That lends itself easy for a jury to then <laughs> listen and say, hey, despite us not having the body, despite us not having you know, that type of physical evidence, we see what type of person and we see the treatment of which you've had to your own daughter. It's a course of conduct that I think is very damning and devastating to the defense's case. Yeah. You know, you hear about what happened to her, Michael, and then you see those pictures of her, and she's smiling and beautiful, and the resilience of kids, any kid that should have to go through that. You know, I hate to say this, but when you think about a child in that situation where they have to come home every day or be in a house with someone that she clearly probably feared, right. um, it, it just breaks my heart, you know, because they really, you know, you're a child, and these are the people that are supposed to be taking care of you, but yet you have this fear of that person. I can't imagine what that I must be I can't either. Like. I can't yeah. either, and the jury listening probably feels the same mm -hmm. way.